So hello everyone and welcome to our Q&A about the frost damage that we have have happened here in Vermont. My name is Lisa Sawsville and I'm with Vermont Coverts Woodlands for Wildlife and we're excited to be hosting Josh Hallman from the Forest Parks and Recreation Department. He's in their forest health area and he's going to share with us uh, what he's seen and knows about frost damage and then give everyone an opportunity to ask some questions. We do have a small number on the call. Uh, you are welcome to type your question in the chat box if you don't want to ask it. If you'd like to ask it yourself, just use the raise your hand function, uh, which is under the more area, and I'll uh, that way we can manage the questions. Uh, if it becomes a little too confusing, we'll go back to the chat box, but we can try it with this small group. So anyway, let me turn it over to Josh. Josh, you tell us a little bit about what you do as a forest health specialist and tell us what you know about frost damage. Great, thanks Lisa, and thanks everybody for joining. Yeah, so um, my name is Josh Hallman. I work uh, for Forest Parks and Recreation out of the Essex Junction office. And our forest health program is largely geared towards, you know, what the name says, identifying what's going on with the health of the forest in general. And um, most of the time that deals with insects, disease, fungi, that sort of thing. But um, of course, abiotic effects are pretty serious to the uh, forest as well. Uh, so that's what I'll be talking about today is kind of uh, what we experienced here in Vermont uh, with this recent spring frost, the effects that that's had uh, for the state, for the region. Um, and in addition to that, uh, what's actually going on in the leaves, what, what's causing this kind of damage, and what does it mean for the trees going forward? Um, so, so one thing to make mention of, I suppose, at the outset here is that I'll strictly be talking about trees today, largely forest trees, but also urban trees as well. Uh, so not really getting into uh, the, the impact on, on like the grape yield or hop yield or something like that that have also been affected by um, the frost, not really focusing on the agricultural species, but more the forest trees. Um, so without further ado, let me just share my screen and make sure that this looks okay here. Um, so hopefully folks can see that and let me make it into a slideshow. Somebody let me know if that's not looking right for you, but if it's full screen, if I, somebody give me a thumbs up, I'll know looks, it's good to go. Looks great, Josh. Awesome. Thanks. Great. So, yes, yeah, so we'll be talking about this spring frost from 2023. Um, and let me close some of this stuff out. Um, great. So just some, to lay the background out here for folks, uh, what exactly happened? Why, why are people reporting frost damage across the region? <clears throat> well, between May 17th and May 18th this year, we received some unseasonably cold weather. Um, some places dipped down into the mid 20s, depending where you were, uh, some were low 20s. And if you go all the way over to the Adirondacks, some folks even had temperatures in the teens. So pretty unusual for May. And the timing really couldn't have been worse. Um, you know, we had warm weather leading into this unseasonably warm weather. And so, so trees and plants in general were, were kind of set up to be developing rapidly uh, to get their leaves emerge to be able to start photosynthesizing and capitalize on, on the field season here. Um, and in so doing and having those leaves either already emerged or in the process of emerging, um, those are susceptible to damage from a, a big swing in temperatures. Uh, and indeed, if you look on the left there, you're seeing some foliage that, that was frosted and, and ultimately died. Um, now, what can happen oftentimes with, with frost events like this is that if it's not as severe as we saw, so let's say it was around 30 degrees or something like that, you might have some damage to uh, an individual leaf, but it might not kill the whole leaf. Um, however, when you cross this line and you get very, very cold into the mid 20s and below that, um, you wind up having full foliar mortality uh, for some species that are impacted by a frost. Um, so that's that's what we've seen throughout not only Vermont, but the region. I, I show this map to show you that uh, we weren't the only state in the area that uh, experienced these temperatures. Colleagues in New York, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts are all reporting some impacts of uh, this freeze event. And indeed, it seems like that's the, the biggest story this spring for, for most forest health professionals is responding to questions and um, letting folks know what's going on with uh, with their trees and what to expect going forward. So. So that's where we're at today as well. <clears throat> now, um, 
one thing that we typically do in our program is we we monitor what's going on in terms of forest health from the sky. So each year we conduct what's known as an aerial survey where we get up in a, a four seat plane and we fly a very specified path throughout the state to document damage from any kind of causal agent, whether that be frost like we have here or different insect damages um, that, that we can see from the sky. And normally that starts quite a bit later. Uh, late June is typically when we start those kinds of surveys. Um, but we, we saw that this was an opportunity and there was a need to at least get a handle on um, what was going on in a portion of the state. So um, a week following this, we were able to, to get up in the air and I'm gonna show a couple images here. Uh, they're not the best images we got. Um, we had hoped to get some better images and they're on our mapping tablets actually that are kind of challenging to transfer them over to a PowerPoint. So um, this, is, this is what we saw to some degree. We saw some more severe impacts than this as well, but you can pick out in those hillsides uh, plenty of trees that, that look like they do not have foliage on them. And indeed that was foliage that was frosted. Um, and so you can see these kind of full hillsides. It almost looks like a defoliation event. You know, when, when we have, whether it's something like forest tank caterpillar or spongy moth outbreaks, this is kind of the symptomology that we see where uh, you have surrounding trees that might be fully green, but then uh, you can also see these brown trees and, and that is the dead foliage on those trees. Um, so this is what it looked like from the air. Um, I should mention that the the route that we flew was um, we flew from from Burlington over to Montpelier, then south to Route Four, followed the White River kind of west from there, uh, and then continue west until we hit Lake Champlain, and then back up to Burlington. So kind of a full circle there. And um, the idea of this kind of flight was not to to map all the acreage right now of of frost damage because. Uh, just for a number of reasons, the timing is challenging to activate a full survey like that. So our goal was to identify some areas where it's known that we had frost damage, capture that information both with photographs, but also uh, with drawing what we call polygons, these kind of circles basically around those affected areas. So that when we do our full aerial survey, we can fly directly back to those spots see what those symptoms look like at that time of the year and apply that kind of symptomology to other areas of the state so we can identify frosted areas even after uh, trees have begun to recover. Um, so we, we expect to, to start those flights for the full survey hopefully next week um, and we'll continue through the field season until we've covered the entire area. Um, so I'll show you some of the images that we, we pull up while we map. So what you're looking at here is a map that that pink line, if you can make that out, is the track that our plane flew. And you can see that's largely along the Winooski River in this uh, graphic and, and then heading south there. And each one of those yellow, orange kind of uh, blobs that you see there, those are areas that we've mapped as being affected by frost. Um, and something that you might notice there is that uh, these polygons are really located along the river valleys. Um, the slopes leading down to the river valley seem to be those areas, at least in this flight, that were the most impacted by the frost. Uh, and this could be for a, probably a couple reasons. One is that those are areas where the cold can settle into pretty easily. Um, but you also have a corridor there where winds are excuse me, ostensibly whipping through there, creating some drying conditions on the foliage as well. So um, you kind of have two factors at play there. And um, so those areas were, were the areas we saw the most damage uh, in this, this particular flight. I, I will say that we did see some areas as well that were not located adjacent to rivers uh, that were kind of obvious that they were in cold pockets. So these, these kind of hollows where the cold can settle as well. So if you think about any area in the state that, uh, that experiences abnormally cold conditions uh, year in and year out, those are some of those areas that were more susceptible to damage in those freezing temperatures. Um, to, to make things a little more challenging for these trees to withstand those temperatures was the fact that many of these species were just having their leaves emerge. Uh, so, you know, obviously there's different species that break bud at different times in the spring, develop their leaves at different times. And um, what we largely saw was that those trees that were known to break bud later in the season were more susceptible uh, to this kind of injury. And I'll get into that in a moment. Um, 
just first wanted to show you another image. This is from that White River watershed there. And again, you're seeing these, these polygons are really focused on those river valleys and the slopes leading to them. Uh, so, so these are the areas we, we saw the most damage in this, particularly down through this White River watershed. Uh, it was it was pretty severe. And I'm sure that as you travel around the state, if you're from different areas that I haven't shown here and you're near a river valley, you've seen something pretty similar. Um, and our goal is to to do a more comprehensive mapping of this as the weeks go forward here. So um, so those are kind of the areas that that we saw that were affected from our flight a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but the question that some people have asked is about which species were actually affected by this kind of a frost. And I mentioned the timing of leaf emergence being something that's pretty critical to this particular event. And as I mentioned, the, those trees that break bud later in the spring uh, were the most impacted. So these are species like your oak species, ash species, beech species. Those are the, the main players that were most severely impacted that we could tell. Um, we've had reports come in from, from other locations as well that walnut species, locust species, sumac, and to some degree, some maple species uh, had some frost damage as well. Um, the maple species, I think most of our reports came from the northeast of the state, but I'm not, um, I don't think that's exclusive just to the northeast. If you have a, a cold pocket where maple was just leafing out, they'd be susceptible as well. Um, but the, this type of foliage is quite sensitive to fluctuations in temperature as uh, the foliage is emerging from the bud. And so that's why those leaves were um, most damaged when compared to, you know, full leaves that might have emerged a week or two prior to that, that, uh, that have some, some ability to defend themselves against the cold. Uh, so those, those brand new leaves were the most susceptible and that's where we were seeing the most damage. Um, and before a couple of days ago, actually, it seemed like it was just hardwoods that were really affected by this. Uh, that's what all our reports were coming in saying. Um, on Friday, I got a, a call from a colleague of mine in the kingdom um, who had mentioned that some landowners had contacted her about uh, possible frost injury to balsam fir. And so um, she went out and took a look at some of these trees. Um, if, if folks know Emily Meacham, she's our protection forester out of St. Johnsbury. And um, she went to at least one Christmas tree farm and we'll, did find that there was some uh, frost damage to those new buds that had broken on balsam fir, which is pretty um, unusual if, if you think about it. Uh, balsam fir is known to be a very cold tolerant species when it's winter time, of course, but um, when it starts breaking bud uh, in the springtime, those buds certainly don't have the cold tolerance that uh, winter foliage would have. And so you did see some of this uh, mortality of that new growth on balsam fir. The, the good news there being that that older foliage, the older needles on those trees were not damaged. Uh, like I mentioned that those older um, needle classes have some defenses built up in them and they're able to withstand some of those cold temperatures, but not the case with some of the new foliage. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this develops, whether or not they are able to produce another set of needles or if they're if this year's growth is just going to be impacted by this and, and hopefully next year things will be better. Um, conifers have a much harder time sending out a second flush of leaves compared to hardwoods in general. And um, so we, we would expect that to be the case here as well, but what we'll have to see. Um, so what exactly is happening when these leaves or needles are exposed to uh, these really cold temperatures? And then just to give a quick little slide on, on the physiology of it, um, it's, a, it's a couple things really happening to, to the leaves and the cells therein. That's what this image is showing. And it's obviously not from a, a microscope. This is a graphic that I found online, but it, it illustrates the point pretty well, which is that when you have leaves that are not, um, they're not hardened off. They, they don't have uh, the cuticle layer that's fully developed. So they, there's this kind of mechanical barrier that is not that present in those new leaves. Um, and you don't have uh, what basically serves as an antifreeze in the leaves, which are sugar concentrations. Um, you don't have high concentrations of those in new leaves because they haven't had a, a long time to develop, their vasculature isn't fully matured. Um, so you, you don't have these sugars that oftentimes can prevent some freezing within the cells. 
And so you, you take into account that with those freezing temperatures and you can have ice formation within the cells of the leaves. Um, and as this image kind of depicts here, as that ice forms, uh, it's crossing membranes, crossing barriers within the cells that uh, is problematic initially, of course, because you, you're disrupting the cells, um, but it actually becomes more of a problem as the ice melts. Um, because then you wind up with these holes in the membranes and the cell walls, and that allows all, all the good stuff that's in those cells to kind of leak out. And when that happens, that actually induces cell death. Those cells aren't able to function anymore. And because of that, um, you have the wilting in the leaves. You don't have any chlorophyll development. That's why things go brown. Um, and, and that's basically the mechanism of the, the frost damage is you don't have the antifreeze within the cell and you don't have a barrier on the outside of the leaves to prevent uh, some of this ice from forming. Um, as leaves get older, develop their vasculature, that sort of thing, those sugar concentrations do get higher. And that's why you don't always see uh, frost damage on older leaf classes or more mature leaves compared to those newly emerged leaves. Um, and I think it's also worth noting too that a lot of times people think that you, you experience a frost and you're going to have foliar death or, or cell death immediately thereafter. And really, because you have to have this thaw happen within the leaves as well, sometimes it can be a few days before you see those symptoms in, in the leaves, the, the browning, the wilting of the leaves. Um, and so it's not uncommon for us to experience a frost event like this. And then three to four days later is when we start getting the big influx of, of inquiries and concern about uh, dying foliage. So that's part of the reason why you have that delay is that uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting process of, of how the, the ice forms, melts, and disrupts the, uh, the, the cells within the leaves. Um, so what's happening now? We had the, the frost event um, not quite a month ago, um, and it, it did quite a bit of damage. Uh, but if you drive around the state right now, uh, depending on where you are, you can see many of those species refoliating. Um, I just went out this morning actually and grabbed these pictures. These are from, uh, from Williston, Vermont, and um, oak and ash trees in, in the stand. And they don't look like they should this time of year, right? We see some browning all over the place. But if you can take a look at the lower canopy on the right image and um, just the upper crown on the left image, you can see that there is new leaf material there. So these trees are uh, recovering. They're um, sending out new growth. Um, they have dormant buds that have now broken and, and leaves are beginning to emerge from those. Um, but this isn't the same for, for all species that were affected by the frost. So depending on what species were affected and how badly they were affected, uh, and also the location within the state, um, things are progressing at, at different intervals. Um, you can see the images on the left here are oak stems that have had the foliage die, but you can see this new flush of leaves coming out there. Um, that was today. And I believe this image on the right, this is from the kingdom um, of beech tree that was frosted pretty heavily. And a bud is just now breaking. The, the beech, um, from most of the reports that we're receiving, have been much slower to respond and relief compared to the oaks and ash. Uh, but we do expect that those beech trees will uh, break, break bud again and send out another flush of leaves. Um, one thing that's worth noting is that the uh, foliage that will emerge from these dormant buds as the second flush of leaves, uh, oftentimes they will be smaller or uh, slightly discolored um, because there's only so much reserve that the tree can pull from. And so they're not going to look like your standard uh, mid-season leaf when they're fully leafed out. Um, they might look a little different this year. Uh, but the fact that they're breaking bud, able to photosynthesize, uh, gain carbohydrates, that sort of thing, the, the trees should recover from this event. Um, so what else are we doing? We are, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to continue this aerial detection survey in the coming weeks uh, to map uh, the, the freeze injury along with any other damage that we see out there. This image shows you basically the, the grid that we fly. We fly each one of those red lines. Um, and map the damage so that we can get a sense throughout the state of what's going on. Um, so that will probably conclude in August at some point. Uh, it takes quite a while to fly the whole state, as you could imagine. And um, by the end of the season, we hope to have some information 
uh, on uh, force damage in general, um, and that would include the freeze damage. So the full assessment and full acreage of area uh, impacted by frost damage will have at season's end. Um, in the meantime, I think some people here may have uh, used the VT invasives link uh, to look at, or excuse me, to submit those areas where frost damage has occurred. Um, that's, like I mentioned, that's present on vtinvasives.org. It's a survey that was developed by Vermont Woodlands Association. Um, and it's really a, a form to, for us to catalog those areas of, of known impact. Uh, we're not right now going out and uh, visiting every place that has had frost damage. As you can imagine, it's a lot. So our, our staff can't really handle that, but it's, it's helpful to have all this information compiled so we can know where to look at for our aerial surveys, but also um, if additional health concerns come up uh, in the future, we know which areas were impacted by frost and we can make an evaluation on whether or not that had an influence on whatever symptoms um, landowners are seeing on their trees. So um, those are the two, two main things that we're seeing uh, or that, that we're doing and plan to do in the future here. Um, as far as recovery in general, I spoke about this a little bit already. Um, but, you know, most trees are able to recover from this kind of frost damage. Uh, if, if trees lose their leaves for a season or two, they typically, if they're a healthy tree going into an event like that, have the capability of refoliating and being able to, to cope with the disturbance, um, send out a new flush of leaves and ultimately recover. Um, you know, growth for a couple of years, radial growth that is maybe reduced a little bit in some of these trees, but in large part uh, their, their health should be fine now if you had trees that were unhealthy going into a frost event like this or had other issues in previous years let's say spongy moth defoliation impacted your trees as well um, in addition to the frost uh, you, you might experience some dieback um, that that is like fine branch mortality on on some of the trees but um, for the most part we expect trees to be able to withstand this kind of a stress event and um, continue to survive. Um, I mentioned that foliage might be smaller and lighter in color. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that after an event like this, that the trees are a little more susceptible to environmental disturbances following this. They've already been really stressed at one point in the year. Um, so if we have something else that comes along, like let's say we develop a drought this summer or something like that, um, that could further stress the trees as well, could lead to some dieback. Um, if you have trees on your property that you're concerned about, that are um, you know, not deep in the forest, that might be shade trees or yard trees or that sort of thing. It's a good idea to keep an eye on the weather. And if we're going through one of those dry periods, um, watering your trees can be a real helpful thing for them um, just to reduce the stress that they're exposed to, to ensure that they can um, continue to, to thrive uh, in the environment where they're living. Um, so that was a brief little snippet of what's going on with, with frost in the area. Uh, and what we expect to happen with the recovery of these trees. Um, but I was hoping that most of today could be just kind of a, a Q and A. Um, if you have questions about frost, I'm happy to take them uh, and see what I can answer. And um, yeah, take it from there. So um, I can go ahead and end the slideshow and stop sharing. That's great, Josh, thank you so much. Sure. Um, I'm going to start off with a question while people are thinking. Um, and as I said, you can either type your question in the chat or you can use the raise your hand function. There's a small group of us, so I can call on you and you can actually ask your question to Josh. Um, but let me start off. Did you notice with the flight that you did do that it was more on north facing slopes? Uh, is that something that, that was more seen? I wouldn't say, um, I, no, I don't think I would say that it was just on north facing slopes. I, I was seeing equal damage on either sides of the, the, the rivers there. Um, it, you could imagine that north sides would, would have it a little rougher in terms of cold exposure and that sort of thing. But I think that, the, you know, I'm not a meteorologist, so part of this is a little speculative. But um, just the nature of a river valley, the way that the cold settles in there, I think that was more of the, the dominant disturbance as opposed to it being um, just on north facing slopes. Um, again, we'll, we'll get a better sense of that as we fly around. It's a small subsample of the state right now. So um, as we get our survey fully completed, we'll be able to address that a little better. As the trees are refoliating, um, is it easy to tell when you're flying? I'm sure people wonder that, like, you know, if they're already recovering 
and depending on when your flights are, will you be able to really get the extent of the frost damage? Right. And that that's a great question. And that's what we were trying to address in this initial flight was to fully map some of those areas where we know there's really bad um, frost injury right now. And when we go up back out to do our full surveys, we'll be passing by those areas so that we can assess the development of, of those areas. And then anything that we see that looks like that area that we have confirmed for having frost damage, we can say, oh, that area looks just like the spot that that's like what we mapped earlier. So we can circle that as frost damage. Um, it will look a little different to answer your question. It will be more chlorotic or more yellow in color. Um, so that's that's one big clue there as, as we're flying. Um, and knowing the, you know, the the pattern that this uh, affected. So if we, we see areas along uh, major river valleys that are a little chlorotic, it's a lot easier to say, oh, that's that's likely frost damage. Um, and we'll map that. And what we do every year, regardless of what the damage agent is, is that if there's any question about what we're recording from the air, uh, we go and ground truth some of those as well so that we can verify indeed this was in this case frost. So. One more question before I get to the few questions in the chat box, because it's on the same realm. Some of the damage that I noticed is in the understory because the overstory trees hadn't necessarily leafed out yet and it was the earlier understory. Yeah. Will you be able to categorize that in any way? Probably not that well. Um, you know, from aerial survey, especially, it's it's hard to get that understory stuff. Um, it's it's pretty seldom that we're able to map that from the air and to to get an acreage estimate for statewide damage to understory would be all groundwork. We'd have to be driving around like crazy. Um, <laughs> but but it's true, you know, that there's certainly um, were plenty of understory plants affected by this. And I should note that, you know, those have, they have a little harder time recovering from this compared to their more mature trees that are in the forest that have been accumulating carbohydrates for years that have these big stores to pull from and put out another flush of leaves. Um, that's not to say they won't recover. It's just that they have a, a slightly harder battle compared to the mature trees. Okay. Um, Deborah was wondering how often does Vermont experience this type of stress? Or well, that's a great question. I don't have a great answer for it either, but I will say that um, I've been in Vermont since 1997 and I've not seen an event that has been this widespread in the state uh, as far as frost goes. It's pretty common that every couple of years or so we have like an, an area within the state that might have frost damage that, you know, might be one particular mountain range, um, might be one river valley or something like this. But for I, I've not seen something that's been this widespread with frost damage where it's extended all the way from New York to Maine. Um, so it's it's a pretty unusual event. OK. Uh, Skip notes that he's been planting black walnut saplings for the last couple of years, hoping to promote forest resilience and diversity. Uh, they lost all of their leaves and now small new ones are emerging. But last year they dropped all their branches in the fall, probably due to drought, he's thinking. Hmm. And he wants to know if they'll new, grow new branches on the lower part of the trunk. He says the new leaves look healthy. They look like muffin tops. <laughs> Well, it's a good question about the branches. I'm not not quite sure how that how quickly that will recover. Um, you know, a branch drop is a lot more significant than just some some petioles of a leaf falling off. Um, the but it sounds like if if those trees are having another flush of leaves come out, that's a good sign that they're going to attempt to recover. Um, and they're putting that energy. The trees are putting that energy into the leaves which as those develop ultimately, you know, will create new branches. Um, so it's it's hard to say probably on, on your property, I'd have to see some images or something like that. But um, but the fact that leaves are re-emerging from those trees is a good sign. Um, I don't know exactly how long you could expect that process to take, but, uh, but the fact that you still have foliage coming out is definitely a good sign. Great. Um, Dan noticed that he's, saw Japanese knotweed get hit by this frost. Um, it seems like it helped to kill them off a little bit. Uh, do we know this, how this will affect the growth and rigor of these invasive plants? Well, I wish it was a good news story. Um, Japanese knotweed is one of those species that you know is really hard to get rid of. And already I've seen 
not weed just come right back. It's, it's just as healthy as if nothing stopped it. So, um, you know, a, a frost event like this, unfortunately, isn't a cure for all the knotweed that we see on our riverbanks these days and elsewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, we, I wouldn't expect uh, it to actually make much of an impact on the vigor of, of those plants. All right. Um, we have a question from Diana. She wants to know what you've seen from the southern part of the state. She's in Halifax, which is on the mass mm -hmm. border, uh, on a height of land between two watersheds, so not a river valley. She says the young trees in their early successional uh, patch got hit hard. Maple was fine, but ash, oak, beech, and even a few cherry got hit. Yeah. Any thoughts for Diana? Um, it sounds like, yeah, th thanks, Diana. It's 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 good to have information from all over the state for us, and we'll, we'll keep an eye out on the ridge tops when we're down and flying in the southern part of the state. Uh, as I mentioned, I, we didn't fly south of Rutland, but we've had reports from, from field staff down that way. Um, I don't know the full extent down there, but you know, I, I have images of oaks and ash that, uh, that were hit with the frost down there. Um, you know, I think that you're likely to see recovery from those. I, I don't expect that it's going to kill your trees. I think they'll, they'll reflush there. Uh, might be a little while since if you're at an upper elevation down there for those to really fully emerge. But, um, but I would expect that those trees to, to recover from, from what you experienced, unless of course they, they had health issues, uh, going into the frost. Um, but we'll, we'll keep a, an eye on all these areas throughout the state and hope to have more information by the end of the summer. Great. Um, Donna was wondering if there were any specific butternut observations that you're aware of. Yeah, we had reports of, of butternut being, uh, affected by frost as well. Again, it was similar in, in timing to leaf emergence. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure, uh, the extent of, of, you know, acreage of just butternut damage, but that was certainly reported to us and, and we've seen a little bit of it. Okay. Um, Martha was wondering, uh, she notes that vtinvasive.org is where they were reporting frost. Uh, is this also where they report spongy moth, EAB, knotweed, knotweed et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's a, a great question. And that's exactly what we uh, intend for that website is there's the report it function there. Um, you can click that button and report what you're seeing um, in addition to the, the frost survey that's on the landing page there. But yes, VT Invasives is really the central point for submitting, um, <clears throat> excuse me, any um, concerns or questions about your trees uh, and especially with invasive pests and invasive plants. So yes, that's definitely the place to go to report that stuff. Do we know if the ash were hit particularly hard in the areas where EABR and and then is that going to further enhance their demise? That's a really good question. Um, we don't have a handle on that fully yet. Um, we didn't make it out to the initial detection of EAB in the state, which has the most severe symptoms, which is out by Plainfield. Um, but I would say that in those areas that already have emerald ash borer and then they received a frost like this, that's that's taking away um, more resources from those trees. So you might expect uh, more rapid uh, progression of symptoms and decline in those trees than you would other areas where emerald ash borer is. Well, great. Um, so if anyone on the call has any more frost questions, again, raise your hand or type it in the chat box. Um, while we're waiting to see if there's any of that, Josh, what else should people either be on the lookout for that you might want reports on or that um, just to be aware of that these are some of the more uh, up and coming stressors in our forests. Yeah, I think Lisa, you and I were talking a little bit before this started about um, the interaction of a frost event like this and those areas that were defoliated by spongy moth the last couple of years. Um, I think that's something that we'd be interested in hearing is if, if you had defoliation from spongy moth the last couple of years and you were hit with the frost, um, it would be it would be good to know about which areas those are you know that's effectively three seasons of defoliation possibly um, which could have some health effects on the trees um, so so reporting that would be helpful and again you could do that through that vt invasives link um, as the the season progresses knowing about spongy moth defoliation in general will be good we'll be again flying the um the entire state and looking for that damage as of yet We've not heard any reports of people having significant defoliation from spongy moth this year, which is great. 
Um, but we do need to verify that. And that's why we'll be going up in the plane for that. Um, as you mentioned, Emerald Ash Borer is a big threat and uh, reporting instances of that or possible suspects you can do through VT invasives. And um, that's something to certainly keep your eyes open for. Um, and I mean, th those are the big ones, you know, obviously the, the classic other pests that we have in the, the area, Hemlock woolly adelgid, which is largely in the Southeast corner of the state. Um, but familiarizing yourself with that insect is, is a good thing to do, uh, especially as our climate warms and uh, temperature is known to be really the main limiting factor for hemlock woolly adelgid um, expansion. Um, and so as we get warmer temperatures, the prospect of that spreading to other areas with hemlock stands is, is something we definitely want to keep an eye on. With that same interaction in mind, um, Deborah was wondering, what about the effects of beech bark's complex in combination with the frost damage? Yeah, for those trees that are, um, you know, riddled with, with beech bark disease, um, and that experience defoliation from the frost, um, yes, it's, it's yet another stress on those trees. So, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's all nuanced to say how uh, quickly or how severely these trees are going to be impacted by this kind of an interaction. But um, those trees that are quite unhealthy from beech bark disease coupled with a uh, frost event like this, uh, you could certainly expect to see some um, some greater dieback in those trees uh, and a more rapid progression of that decline. With the thought of climate change coming along and, you know, we are having these sort of earlier warmer springs, but then these frost events, is this something that they're predicting is going to happen more? I'm not a climate change expert, um, but I believe that, you know, these kind of certainly with the, the earlier springs, later falls, um, you know, these these things are likely to be more frequent, um, you know, both both with the earlier seasons, as well as the prediction of increased um, large fluctuations in temperature, extreme weather events, that sort of thing. Um, it's just less predictable. Uh, so it's not unlikely that this will be uh, the last time we see a frost event like this. Um, hopefully it's not for a while, but uh, you know, things, things are changing out there. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to predict and might guide you to, to somebody a little more versed in the climate science. Um, Ali Kasiba at UVM Extension certainly knows quite a bit about that. Um, so I might refer you to her, but, uh, it seems like this is something that, um, I wouldn't say is going to become the norm, but, uh, it's, it's not that shocking, unfortunately. Right. Right. So as a, as a landowner, you know, we often talk about the importance of a diverse forest to be more resilient to insect diseases and other pathogens. And I would assume it's sort of the same kind of recommendations to even deal with these frost things with the more diverse forests, we're going to have leaves emerging at different times. We're going to have um, a lot more, uh, I don't know, good things happening in our forests. Is that is that the same here? Is that the same recommendation for our landowners that are on the call? Yeah, you know, depending on where you are, it um, the the suite of tree species that you might have growing on your property. Um, you know, some of them you might you might have, you know, oaks and ash growing side by side, which would both be kind of susceptible to this kind of thing. But in general, yes, keeping a diverse forest is uh, is really important for the, the reasons you described. Um, and yeah, it creates resiliency with, within the forest. Um, make sure that the ecosystem is still functioning as opposed to, you know, when you have a massive defoliation event like we've had with spongy moth, for instance, where uh, you know, it's a fully open canopy in the middle of July uh, that has impacts on, on, on wildlife, on regeneration, on invasive plant species that are growing. Um, so if you have a more diverse forest um, that responds to frost differently, then certainly um, you maintain some of those ecosystem services a little better and have a little more resiliency within your woods. Yeah, um, Martha typed in there, what's being done about the trend of homeowners clear cutting their property and planting all grass? Martha, I'm going to just say that's really not something that we're going to cover today in a forest health talk, although it is important. It's really up to towns and their conservation commissions to kind of set some of those guidelines and people like you and other people on this talk, 
call telling people the importance of native habitat, of rewilding areas, of not planting lawns. Sure, you have a little area to play in, but maybe keeping more of it again uh, in a diversified, resilient way. You can direct them to Doug Tallamy's talk that we hosted on our YouTube channel. Uh, also direct them to read some of his books. Nature's Best Hope is a wonderful example. That's really focused on in towns and we're really focusing more on the forest itself. But thank you for the question. Skip, is your hand raised? <laughs> Would you like to go ahead and ask the question? You can unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I know this isn't exactly on topic, but uh, it has, it's on topic with uh, resilience and diversity. And uh, I've been asking everybody that I can that has more information than me, which is a lot of people. Um, and, and what about bringing in species, native species, that may not be totally indigenous uh, to our neighborhood or that have been on the edge? and looking 20 to 50 years in the future um, and trying to create a, a more diverse forest because the forest out there right now, even though it seems like it's a natural product, actually is um, very man-made because we cut 80% of it down and what's regrown, so forth and so on. So um, what are your thoughts on bringing in things like you know, black walnut or, um, sycamore or other other species that um to, to, to basically try to create a, uh, a resilience and a diversity yeah it's it's a good question and something that a lot of people are thinking about right now you know most people thinking about it in terms of of climate change and and adaptation for a warming climate that sort of thing and so <clears throat> they're they're talking about the, the term assisted migration where you're bringing some of these southern species further north to to fill in some of these gaps. And um, I think it's an interesting idea. I think that um, there is a lot of research being done on it right now to, to identify uh, how that would all play out. And, you know, there's gonna be pros and cons to, to that kind of introduction um, pretty, pretty, pretty clearly. Um, is it gonna, you know, displace other native species? What's, what's the impact of, of spread of some of these Southern species that get put in the North? Um, so I think it's certainly a technique that is worthy of a lot of consideration and research. I don't think that we know enough right now to say, yes, let's, let's bring the southern species up and, and create these, these habitats uh, forecasting 20 to 50 years down the line. Um, but it's, it's certainly something that, that needs to be in the conversation. Um, I don't think that we have a, a great handle on it at this point, but it, it's something that uh, needs to be looked at and, and people are looking at it. Right. So so we're going to, you know, we're going to lose more than likely a lot of our our ash trees. Um, we, you know, I mean, all of these are nightmares, but, you know, um, you know and our hemlock, you know, if, it, if they get devastated like they are in Massachusetts, is it's going to be a tragedy. And, you know, once that happens, you know, it's already we're going to lose 10 or 20 years of um, re starting this regrowth. Um, so is, is there, um, or, if, you know, if, if in your research, if you, you know, let Lisa know of sites uh, or people that are doing that kind of uh, research, I, I would be very interested. Uh, I, I understand um, perhaps you, you know, you're speaking for the state, so you have to follow what, um, or, you know, what, what is the agreed on uh, protocol at this point in time, but, I don't want to do anything that would be negative, but you know, it's it's like it's like in Hollywood. There are a lot of people that can say no. There's only one person at the at the place that can say yes. But in my case, because um, I own these lands, I want to be able to move forward, even if the research isn't complete. Yeah. Um, so I'm look, but I'm looking for help on moving forward, even if it's kind of like. You know, you're taking that medication, you know, off of, uh, off, oh, I forget how they call it, um, off label. Uh, yeah. You know, so, you know, I'm looking for off label. <laughs> yeah, which species well, those aren't going to come in a group form, Skip. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Thanks so much for your question, though. <laughs> I, I will tell you this, Skip. Um, you know, 
people that are doing this research, and I'm not one of them, there's, you know, there's a group at UVM that's doing this kind of research. There's, there's groups all over the country doing this kind of thing. Um, but we, uh, within the Forest Health Program, we're in the process of developing um, one tool that's specific to Hemlock, but in, in the next few months, um, or it might be by years and depending how the, the editing process goes, but we've been developing this, uh, it's kind of a conservation guide for Eastern Hemlock. And one of the sections of that shows a, a number of species that you could plant uh, in place of hemlock, some of which are already here. And we go through many of the, the traits that they have, not recommending any one per se, because it's gonna differ depending on your habitat and, and, and where you're planting things. Um, but there, there is some information that's coming out about you know, species that are good replacement species for the, some of these, these trees that you're concerned about. Exactly, yeah. Well, <laughs> certainly look forward to more information on that in the future. Great. Thanks, Skip. And I will say you can follow up um, or even look at Ali Kostiba's uh, extension website. She has a, a, a graphic of some of the trees and where they fit within um, the opportunity to, of doing some, not really assisted migration, but which ones to kind of promote more than others for resilient forests. So check out her website. I'll see if I can put it in the chat in a moment. Uh, we did have one other question uh, that popped in there. And they're wondering, Josh, if you knew any of the effects on fruit trees, not the big, you know, fruit trees in the apple farms, but like, you know, those that we, we yeah. release for, for deer and, and on our land that are in the understory often. So. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I, I don't have a great handle on the agricultural species, but, um, you know, apples certainly took a hit um, this year. And, you know, we have colleagues that, uh, that have active orchards and I know that they were, they were happy that they had 30 to percent to 40% uh, survivability from this frost. I guess one of the things, and again, I'm not an expert here, but one thing to look at is not just whether the petals fell off, but but deeper into the flower there to see if there's any browning. And if browning is is present on some of those, um, that's an indication that you, your, your flower crop may be lost on that particular tree. Um, as far as statewide effects on fruit trees, um, I don't have a good handle on it. I know that um, we've seen a some elevated eastern tent caterpillar activity on some fruit trees this year so that interaction um might be an issue for for some trees i i have not seen it so widespread that it mirrors the, the frost pattern or anything like that um but you know it seems like there, there might be a couple things at play in terms of fruit tree health this year okay great well, it doesn't look like there are any other questions in the chat box, and you've answered most of mine. Uh, do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share uh, with the landowners? Um, I guess, you know, I think that two things. Uh, one is, I mentioned it in the talk, but if, if you have trees of concern around your property, um, keeping an eye on dry conditions and making sure that those are, are well watered if possible this year uh, can certainly help yard trees. Um, and secondly, to, to just be a little patient with uh, the trees releafing. Um, things are starting to get underway right now. They're not gonna look the same as they did last summer for you, um, but it's, it's looking like things are starting to move in the right direction in terms of putting out another set of leaves um, so that we can hopefully continue to have healthy forests here. Great, thanks so much, Josh. And thanks for making time. I know this is your busy field season. So it was great to have you for this Q and A uh, over lunch. Uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, it was a lot of fun having you. Again, my name is Lisa Sosville of Vermont Coverts. You can follow us uh, on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, you can also um, join and sign up for our e-news where you can hear about this program and others. I see a lot of our cooperators who are on this call. So it's really good to see many of you and your names or your faces. And uh, I hope you all have a great week. And uh, I look forward to seeing our forests as they recover from this frost damage. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.